Good evening. Um, I do have a little bit of a croaky voice this evening. I'm Claire, I'm Claire Viner. I'm the storyteller with a croaky voice um, because I've had an absolutely stinking hold, but um, I'm here and I'm not in pain. So although my voice sounds a bit croaky, um, you don't need to worry about me. But you might notice me sipping my tea as I'm telling stories because it's a well, you know, well tested tradition of drinking licorice tea when I'm telling stories it really helps my throat and my voice. Um, so, yeah, I've been um, working on this project since around about June and um, it was back in June. I started walking along the River Calm and um, going into libraries, talking to people. And quite quickly, I discovered that although the, like, all the people in the libraries were really helpful and they'd give me these great big stacks of books, of you know, myth and folklore of Devon and Somerset, and, you know, I'd be really excited and I'd take all these books away. And then there seemed to be an awful lot of myths and legends written about Devon and Somerset, but not that many of them written down from the Calm Valley. So immediately that was, that was interesting. And it was like, there was a story about the fact that none of the stories had been written down or hardly any. So for me, in a way, this was an exciting beginning to the story because how I work with story and how I have worked with story before is like, I feel a little bit like I'm a kind of an archeologist and I go and I find these little fragments of stories or little shards of stories, little hints of, of that there might be a story here somewhere. And then I, I kind of dig it up and I clean it up a bit and um, start to develop a story. So that's what I've been doing on the Calm Valley. And what I've discovered in the Calm Valley is there are legends of buried treasure under Killerton Hill. There is a legend of a dragon who lives at Killerton and um, protects and guards the treasure. I'm gonna tell you a bit more about the dragon in a minute, but first I just wanna tell you about one of the treasures that I dug up. I'm going to, I've only got a bit less than an hour, so I haven't really got time to tell you all the stories that I've um, discovered. But what I'm going to aim to do is to just try and give you um, like a little taste of some of the jewels that I've dug up along the banks of the River Calm. And the first treasure that I dug up along the banks of the River Calm, it's long and it's thin and it has a big, big bulbous part at the front of it. And this, this treasure, in fact, is the skeleton of a dragonfly. And I found this treasure along the banks of the Kong. And then I discovered there's some great folklore about dragonflies because people say that the dragonfly, the dragonfly is known as the devil's darning needle. Now, whenever I hear a story about a devil, there's a bit of me that kind of pricks up my ears because whenever people are telling stories about devils, you can be pretty sure they want you to not like whatever it is that's in that story. So I wondered, what is there to not like about a dragonfly? This beautiful creature, this iridescent creature that dips in and out of the waters. And as I was walking along the river in, in June, well, not so much in June, but a bit later, in the later summer, in the early autumn, I was seeing a lot of dragonflies dipping in and out of the water. And that's when I came across Ida. Now, I'll tell you about Ida because Ida was an old, old woman who lived in Willand. And Ida had a big wicker basket and she would go round from house to house knocking on the doors. Have you got any washing you need doing? Um, I can do your washing for you if you just put it in the basket. And all the people would come out of the houses and they'd give Ida their washing. Now there was a lot of people in the village who looked down the noses a bit at her. She was just an old woman who did the washing. But there were some people who treated her with a bit more respect. And that was because they understood that Ida, she didn't just wash the spilt food and the mud and the dust from your clothes. No, Ida, she had a little bit of magic about her. And she would also wash the arguments and the grief and the loss and the words that shouldn't have been spoken. She'd wash all of them out of your clothes as well. She'd take them down to the river, down to the side by the river, of, by the river column. She'd get the dirty washing out of the basket and then she would rub, rub, rub on the washing on an old stone. And as she was rubbing the washing, she would sing a song. I could try and sing the song, my voice is a bit croaky, but I'll give it a go. 
The river is flowing, flowing and going. The river is flowing down to the sea. And the song would go on and on as Ida sang her songs. And often she would kind of make the words up as she was going along. And a lot of the other women from the village, they'd come down and they'd sit with her by the river. They liked to try and get her to tell them stories because she knew a lot of stories about the river. They liked to try and get her to teach them a little bit of the magic she knew. She sometimes taught a little bit, but she didn't tell them too much. And one afternoon they were there and a man came down from, from the village, from Willand, and he said, please, Ida, I need a new job. All right, said Ida, come and find me by the oak tree tonight. And that night there was Ida sitting by the big oak tree with a big piece of fabric in her hand and a big, long needle. She had the needle all at the ready and she said, what colour is it, the new job you need? Oh, I don't know, said the man. What do you mean? What colour is it, said Ida. Mm, blue. Right, good colour, said Ida. And she let down into her basket and she pulled out some blue wool and she threaded it onto that big old needle. She threaded the wool onto the needle and she started to stitch. What shape is it? I don't know. What shape is it? And she started to stitch a little bit more until finally he said, mm, maybe it's the shape of a boat. And there she stitched the blue boat into her fabric. And it wasn't long after that, that man, he had a new job down along by the river, helping the men pull fish up out of the, out of the water. And there were plenty of others that came to Ida. Please, Ida, we're trying to have a baby. Please, Ida, we need a new house. And so the requests would go on and people got used to Ida and her strange questions. They knew that they just had to answer the questions as best they could and Ida would stitch whatever they said into the fabric. And then, sure enough, not too long after that, the baby would come along or the new job or the new house. People said, it's because of Ida and her magic, her magic stitching needle. But of course, as time passed, there came people who, who didn't want Ida sharing her stories and her magic. They said, it's the devil's darning needle. But that magic needle, at some point, it must have fallen from Ida's belt, the place where she always kept it safely tucked in. And that's where I found it, down by the in the mud, down by the banks of the River Calm. And you can decide for yourself if you think it's a devil's darning needle or if you think it's a magic darning needle. But if you're lucky, you might see the dragonflies dipping in and out of the water. So that's my first story, the story of Ida, the washerwoman. And uh, I'm gonna tell you another story now. Because if you go down the River Calm, and you go from Willand and you keep going, following the flow of the water down past Columpton and you keep going and you go down past Silverton and finally you get to Killerton. <clears throat> now, if you've been traveling along this path, this watery path a few thousand years ago, you might have found when you got to Killerton, there was a big dam there across the water it was built by the beavers. They dammed up the water there down at Killerton. So any little boat that came drifting down the water would stop there once it got to Killerton. Now, the story goes that if you go to Killerton, up there on your left, if you're in a little boat in the river, up there on your left is Killerton Hill. And the story goes that there's a dragon that lives in Killerton Hill and there's another dragon that lives on the other side of the river over on your right, and that's at Cadbury Hill. And the story says that the dragon, he winds his body around and around inside the hill, whichever hill it is that he's in. And he's been there for thousands of years, just there inside that hill. And he's always looking, looking out. He's always watching. And you can never quite know if he's in Killerton Hill or Cadbury Hill because he flies across at night time. But if you go up, even to this very day, if you go up to Killerton or Cadbury Hill and you look around, you might find a puddle or a pool or a kind of whir in a tree or a stone with a hole in it. And that, whatever it is, that might just be the place where the dragon is looking. 
it's impossible to tell where his eye is actually looking out from, but you can be sure that his eye will be looking out somewhere on that hill. And on this particular day, quite recently, there was a woman walking up the hill. The dragon looked at her as he looked at everyone. And as he looked at her, he could see inside her. That's the thing about dragons because they've got fairy blood as well as dragon blood. They can see inside a person as well as the outside. And as he looked into this woman, he could see, he could see that she was very intelligent and he could see that she had a vision. Ah, thought the dragon as he looked closely at her. She has a vision. And I recognize that vision because the vision the woman had was a vision of the river in a very different place from where it had been for a long, long time. This woman, she understood that the river needed to go slower and that there needed to be pools and ponds and that the floodplains needed to be opened up again. Now this woman, as it happened, was a scientist, but that didn't mean anything to the dragon. He could just see inside her head and she, he could just see what it was that she wanted for the water, for the river. She wanted the water to be crystal clear again, like it used to be, and so many more things. And the more the dragon looked at her, the more the dragon began to remember how it used to be for him long, long ago, thousands of years ago, when he was just a young dragon. You see, the dragon could remember the warriors who used to live there on the hills. The dragon could remember those warriors with their matted hair and their matted beards and their eyes as bright as tiger's eyes. The dragon remembered. What fun that warriors used to have up there on those two hills with, they used to light big fires and often they would tell stories, wonderful stories about what they had done when they had gone down to the river to meet with the ladies of the waters. And whenever anyone new arrived, because from time to time, new warriors would arrive and come up to join them there on their hills. Whenever anyone new arrived, they'd say, you must go down to the water and call on the ladies of the waters. And this was what each warrior did. And one day, one warrior went down to the water and he called out, ladies of the waters, come and play with me. This is what he'd been told to say. And no sooner did he say the words than up out of the water came a shining head with beads of water dripping from her glossy hair. And as she stood up and rose up out of the water, she was wearing what she would call called a dress, but what we would probably say was more like a wetsuit. It was all tight and woven as if it was made of fish skin, carefully stitched and woven together, as if it had been made by magic, which maybe it had. And she had eyes as wild and untamable as a wild cat's eyes. And she walked up from the water towards this warrior. What do you want to play? She said. Uh, you must choose, said the warrior wisely. Very good, said the lady of the waters. And she walked right up to the warrior and she took his two gnarled hands in hers. And she looked deep into his eyes and then she sang. You and then she sang more, but it was a language, a very extraordinary language, which hasn't been spoken on this land for thousands of years. And it's kind of lucky that I can't tell you the rest of the words that she sang in her song, because if I could have told you what the words were, and if you could have repeated them back, as the warrior began to repeat back, Linu nani nani chi back with her. Perhaps you'd like to have a go at singing that with me. Linu nani nani chi. Linu nani nani chi. Linu nani nani chi. Linu nani nani chi. So that was just the start of the song. And then it went on. But as I said, I can't teach you the rest of it. And it's a lucky thing that I can't really, because if I could teach you the rest of that song, and if I could teach you the dance that then went with the song, the dance that the lady of the water began to show that warrior, the dance that went up and down and around and back and forth. And as they sang their song and danced their dance, the warrior began to feel a very strange thing starting to happen, which was that his skull started to shrink 
down very, very small. And he started to feel his skin becoming covered all over in fur. And he started to feel his arms shrinking down to little paws. And when he looked across where the lady of the water had been standing, he saw there wasn't a lady there, but an otter. <laughs> she said, we are otters, come. And she leapt into the river calm and he leapt in after her and they swam through those crystal clear waters as they were in those days. And she showed him how to catch the golden trout in their sharp teeth and to crunch them up. And then they started to catch all the other fish. There were all number of fish in the river in those days, blues and pinks and purples. And all day they swam through the waters, catching and crunching up the fish. Oh, the joy of it, the thrill of it, of being an otter, of feeling the water, not just looking at it, not just looking at an otter, but being an otter. And at the end of the day, up they came and out of the water. And the otter, the otter lady, she banged her tail two, 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 three times on the earth. And no sooner had she done it, than the otter that had been the man, he started to grow, to expand his skull, expanding out his skin, going all smooth again, and his arms and his legs growing, until there he stood on the riverbank, staring at the lady of the waters. As he stood there, he was just the same as he had been at the beginning of their adventure, and yet he was completely changed. He was completely different. He'd had such a wonderful experience. And when he went back up to the top of Killerton Hill where all the other warriors were sitting around the fire, he told them the story of what had happened to him. And all the others, they said, yes, yes. And they told their stories. And there was one of the knights there, his name was Geraint. He came from Clayhiden. I haven't got time to tell you all of his story now. Only to tell you that he had a great many adventures with the lady of the ladies of the waters and one of them was where he became a white deer. But I can't tell you that story now, as I haven't got time, but only to tell you there were many, many tales of becoming kingfishers and beavers and wolves and bears and all number of creatures there by the river. And the men, the warriors, they loved that river and they loved the ladies of the waters and all the animals and the land with such a passion and a joy in their heart because they didn't just look at it, they became it. But there was a great deal of destructive forces moving across the lands at these times. Boats, many, many boats coming up and down the rivers filled with armed men. This was the reason Geraint had come to join with these warriors and many of the others had come from other parts of the country, all of them coming together, trying to fight against these destructive forces. But one night, just as it was starting to get dark, a little boat came up the river and in the little boat there was just one man and the little boat hit the beavers dam. And there as it hit the beavers dam, it came to a stop. And the ladies of the waters, they peered over into the boat. And when they saw the man in the boat, they saw how wounded he was. Quick, said one of them, fetch the bowl. And the bowl was brought. This was a bowl which had been handed down from mother to daughter for thousands of years. And the bowl was dipped into the clear water. And one of the ladies, she breathed over the bowl. And no sooner had she breathed on the bowl than the water in the bowl started to shine like a star. And this was healing water here in the bowl and they sprinkled it over the man and then they took ointments and they took herbs and they used all of their healing powers and the ladies of the waters, they had a great deal of healing powers. And they healed the man of all his wounds, except that he was blind and they couldn't heal his blindness. Two of them said, we must take him to the men and they helped him out of the boat. They took him up the hill. And there the men were sitting around the great fire. And one of them who was sitting with a huge bare skin over his shoulders. It wasn't a bear that he had killed, but a bear that he had been his dear friend who had died of old age. And now this king, he wore the skin of this great bear as a mark of honor to his friend. Who is this man? said the king. And the ladies of the waters said, we don't know. 
but he has a story to tell for sure, because we cannot click cure his blindness. And then the great king in the bare skin, whose name was Arthur, he said, welcome, come in, tell us your story. And the blind man came and he sat by the fire. And then he told a terrible story, a story of destruction, a story of pollution, the river being polluted and the animals being hunted and killed and everything changing and so much being taken away. And then the blind man said, and I'm not blind. And I, the reason I'm blind is not because of what I've seen, but of because of what I can see that is coming in the future. And he spoke of thousands of people coming in in boats and taking and destroying everything. He said, there is nothing you can do, although you are big, brave warriors here. Against them, you will be useless. There are too many of them. There is nothing you can do. Everything will be lost. And when the warriors heard this, they started to cry and to wail and great tears poured down their cheeks and the tears rolled down the hill and down into the river Calm. And there the ladies of the waters caught up the tears in little vials that they wore around their necks. And after they'd finished crying, the warriors said, there must be something, there must be something we can do. And they started to stamp their feet and they started to sing and shout. And the passion in their hearts, it burst out of their hearts like rain and it fell down like rain, like fiery rain into the river. And the ladies of the waters, they caught up this fiery rain and they added it to the vials that they wore around their necks. And they held the vials to their hearts and then the ladies of the waters began to swim up and down around the rivers. And as they swam through the waters, they also began to cry. And then the waters began to rise up. And the more they cried, the more the waters rose, like a lady rising up from her bed and the waters rose and they flooded as that river has never flooded before or since. Until all that was left, was like two little islands, Killerton Hill and Cadbury Hill. And the ladies of the waters, they swam to where the, the warriors were shouting and, and singing their songs. And the ladies of the waters, they came up, their heads bobbing up, clear, bright heads coming up out of the water. And the warriors came to the edge of the water and they said, what can we do? There must be something. Tell us, tell us what to do, ladies. You have magic, tell us. The ladies of the waters said, there is something you can do. But in order to do it, you must give up your identity, your individuality. You must become one. As individuals, you cannot fight this, but as one being, there is something you can do. Yes, shouted one of the men. Yes, yes, came the cry. And the ladies, they looked into the faces of these men they had loved so much. They said, oh, beloved men, there will come a time when we will see you again because we have fairy blood and you do too. And that means we will live forever, but it will not be for a long time. And then they turned themselves into fish and they began to swim in a great figure of eight between Killerton and Cadbury Hill. They began to swim very fast. And then they turned themselves, their upper bodies just into women and their lower bodies still as fish. And then they began to sing. Now this was not the song of a dragonfly or a kingfisher or an otter or a wolf or a bear or a deer. This was not one of those songs. This was the song of war. This was a song to raise energy up. It was very loud and very fast. And after a while, the men started to realize that they must join in with this song. And the song grew louder and stronger until eventually, as it grew and grew and grew and grew, the men started to turn into fire, into balls of fire. And just then, all the birds from the forest, they came flying in and they caught some of the fire on their wings and they began to fly between the two hills as well. And as they flew between the two hills with the fire on the tips of their wings, the warriors started to turn into a great fiery serpent that met 
just over the place where the river Calm had once flowed. And the fiery serpent, it twisted and it turned. And eventually it started to grow a snout and it started to grow wings and it started to grow claws and it started to become the dragon. Now all of those warriors had become one great fiery dragon and the dragon, he went to the edge of Killerton Hill and he sat there on the edge of the hill and he roared a great roar into the waters. What, said the dragon, is the treasure? The treasure, said the ladies of the waters, is all the stories and the memories everything that you know in your heart about becoming the land and the water. The treasure is the stories and the memories, dear dragon. Guard these well, dream them often. And one day, one day they will come back. And then the dragon, he wound himself around and around Killerton Hill and sunk inside the earth. And the ladies of the waters, they dived back down into the water and the water shrunk back into the place where the river calm continued to flow. And those ladies, some people say they swam far, far out to sea. And some people say they stayed for a long time in the pools and the lakes and the wells that were for a long time all around the river calm. But of course now, now they have mostly had to go deep, deep down underground because the water's become too polluted and the wells are mostly no longer there. But the dragon stayed and the dragon continued to watch out of the hill. The dragon was watching every day with his eye as history turned and the landscape changed. And then on this particular day, as the dragon was watching and he saw this woman, this very clever woman. <coughs> and in this moment, the dragon under his hill, he smiled a great smile and he said to himself, mm, all that dreaming I've been doing, all that dreaming, of my beautiful valley and my beautiful waters, the humans are starting to receive it at last. And that night when the dragon went to sleep, he had a wonderful dream. He dreamt of the pools and the ponds and the lakes and the wells again. And in his dream, he stretched out his claw and he scratched a great pond out of the landscape. And when he woke up in the morning, the dragon could hardly believe it because there in the floodplain where the pools and the ponds are long since gone, there scraped out in the shape of a dragon's claw, there was a new pond. It seemed the humans had built it. And the dragon, the dragon nodded there under his hill and he wondered to himself, well, if I keep dreaming, if I keep sending my dreams to the humans, I wonder if the animals, if they'll all come back, the beavers maybe. I wonder if the trees and the biodiversity and maybe the children, oh, the dragon remembered the children, how they used to sit there by the river dangling their feet into the water and begging the ladies of the water, please, please teach us how to become otters and beavers and all those things that you teach the men. But the ladies would always say, no, you're not old enough yet. Maybe the children would come back too and they would start learning by the river again. And maybe the ladies of the waters would come back. Maybe they would. So that's, that's the end of the tale of the dragon <clears throat> at Killerton. Um, I just interrupt Claire. Um, yeah. I'd just like to ask everybody to unmute to give you a round of applause if that's okay I forgot to ask um, people at the beginning if we could do that after each story because I know it's a little bit difficult when we're in an online environment um, that kind of you know 
normal thing that we would do but if everybody would like to join me um i can't i don't think people can hear me because i've got a headphone headset on but hopefully you'll be able to hear everybody else um joining me in a wonderful round of applause so thank you <laughs> thank you Thank you. Um, I mean, all of these stories, they're all um, kind of evolving and growing all the time. They're not scripted. So each time I tell the stories, they're a little bit different. Um, and uh, yeah, it's quite, it's a bit, it's a bit interesting trying to tell it on, on a Zoom call. But, <laughs> um, but what I, what I really, um, I, I went up to Killerton recently, and I don't know if any of you have been up there, but there are these wonderful new, they're called scrapes. And they do look, they have this sort of curvy, they've been trying, they're following the line of the, um, the original line of the old river. So, so that, you know, they're these kind of organic looking shapes and they are kind of like ponds are being dug out so that when the river floods, it can start to return to this um, kind of natural, more natural state of having ponds and pools around it. I think, is that right, Sarah? <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to tell you another story now that is um, much more modern. And this story comes, uh, the reason I've got this story, where this story comes from, is um, a little book called Tales of the Black Down Borderlands that was published in 1923 by F.W. Matthews. It was put into my hands by an archaeologist quite a long time ago, and I had to give it back. And since then, as far as I can work out, there are no copies of this book in the public domain in the West Country. The only, I went into the Devon and Exeter Institute as part of my research and um, they tried to find this book for me. And they said, no, the only place you can get hold of it is Cambridge, a library in Cambridge or somewhere up north. Um, so this seemed a bit sad to me really, because um, it's a bit of a treasure, this book. Um, the tale of Garant and Cle coming from Garant, one of King Arthur's knights who came from Clay Hyden. That's in this book. Um, obviously, the stories of King Arthur um, at Cadbury Hill. There have been rumours and whispers of that story for a long, long time. Um, but yeah, Tales from the Black Down Borderlands, this story comes from. Um, and so this story is set in about the 1900s, coming into much more recent history. And uh, in the 1900s, um, Clay Hyden, as we know it today, um, was down, kind of down much nearer to the river in a place called, that's now called Rosemary, Rosemary Lane, Rosemary Road, not quite sure. Um, so in those days, if you went to Clay Hyden, the village was near the river. And if you went to the pub, the village, the pub was near the river. And this story comes from the pub in Clay Hyden. Because according to the story, it was every Thursday night, the local men used to meet up down there at the pub. There was Jack Quant who played on the trumpet and there was a man called Abraham Stocker who played a euphonium, but no one could say euphonium. They thought it was a really silly posh word. So they called it his euphony thingy what's it. Abraham Stocker played on his euphony thingy what's it, Jack Quant on the trumpet. Someone else was playing the trombone and who knows how many other men would all gather there every Thursday night playing away on their brass instruments. But what they didn't know was that attracted by the music as the fairy people always are, squeezing under the door, squeezing, oh, my computer's doing something strange. Squeezing under the door, squeezing in through the keyholes, down the chimney, any other way they could get in. If anyone left a window open, that made it even easier. In came the pixies and the fairies. They would come into that pub and they would sit and they would listen to the men playing the music because there's nothing they like better than a bit of music. And as they listened to the music, they'd be dancing, they'd be stamping their feet, all completely invisible to the men in the pub playing their music. When the men had finished playing their music, they'd sit themselves down, they'd get themselves a pint, and they'd start talking about all sorts of things they didn't know anything about, but they liked to pretend they did. And um, one night, as they were sitting there with their pints of beer and talking, they got on to talking about the pixies and the fairies. And in those days, there was a lot of people who really did have a lot of respect for the pixies and the fairies. <coughs> but Abraham Stocker, as he sat there listening to these tales that these grown men were telling, 
He was a man, Abraham Stocker, he was a man of reason. He was a man of progress. He didn't like these stories at all. And as he listened to the stories, he could feel himself getting more and more angry. These ridiculous stories. And it got to a point where he banged his pint of beer down on the bar and he said, this was all nonsense. There were no such thing as pixies, nor fairies, nor jaxies. They didn't exist. And that were the truth. He picked up his euphony thing he once said. He pulled his hat down over his head. That were the truth, he said. If that be the last words, I do speak. And saying that, he stormed out of the pub and banged the door shut. The pixies were all rubbing themselves. Because, you know, if you say the pixies don't exist, they start to disappear. And some of them started to really get quite upset. But amongst those pixies, there was a great queen whose name was Joan the Wad. Joan the Wad, the queen of the pixies. And Joan had left her wad, her great wad of burning hay and straw outside the pub. She never brought it into a human dwelling. But when she heard these words and she saw how frightened all her pixies were and all the fairies were as well, she said, now you listen to me, my friends. This man, he is very lost and we must show him the way home. Come. And she took all the pixies out of that pub. She picked up her burning wad of hay and they disappeared out into the night. It was late autumn and a very cold, frosty night as Abraham Stoker was stumbling home. He'd had a beer or two and he kept tripping and falling over. When he picked himself up, la 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 la, there was a little light up ahead of him. It was funny, he thought. I think it must, have, must be a light or someone's left it on in one of the, in the village of Ashcombe. That must be where I'm going. He lived in Ashcombe, you see. He had all that way to go, but he knew that way like the back of his hand but he started walking in the direction of the little light and he stumbled and he fell again la 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 it's funny he said it. oh well he started walking in that direction and he fell again la 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 every time he fell over and picked himself up the light seemed to be shining in a different direction and he kept on following it and following it and then suddenly he felt his feet very squelching underneath him. And then before he had time to really take in what was happening, he felt his feet sinking into the ground. And, and the next thing he knew, he was up to his knees and he started struggling and he was up to his waist. And then with a horrible moment of realization, he discovered that he had fallen into the Springline mire, a bog far from the path that he should have been taking back to Ashcombe. And he knew in that moment that if he kept struggling, he would just sink down into the water. Because he'd seen many, he'd heard the stories in the pub of many cows and horses that had struggled and met a watery grave there in that boggy place. And then he saw something that frightened him even more, which was there in front of him with her great burning wad of hay was Joan the Wad, the queen of the pixies herself. Oh, Abraham, she said, you have come a long way from home. We've come to show you, we've come to show you the way back. <clears throat> and then she began to sing a strange song in a language which he had never heard before. And then he started to see all the other little pixies all around him all holding little lanterns. And as they stood all around him, they were all seemed to be pointing at him and giggling. And for a long time, Joan the Wad, she just sang to Abraham and it was as if he was hypnotized by her song. And then very suddenly the song stopped and Abraham felt just how cold he was. Oh, he said. He knew that if he struggled, he would sink, but if he stood still, he would surely freeze to death there in the there in the bog. Just then, Joan the Wad, she leant across and she whispered something to one of the pixies. As quick as a flash, the pixie turned herself into a little bird and flew up onto Abraham's shoulder. Abraham, 
said the pixie. If you want people to come and help you, why don't you play on your foamy thingy, what's it? People will hear the music and they'll come. Oh, said Abraham, and he twisted his euphony thingy whops it around and he started to play. Pom, 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 pom. The sound echoed out across the hills. You can join in if you like, and we can do a bit of pom, pom, pomming. He's got to pom, pom really loud because he's trying to get the attention of the people to come and rescue him. So I can't see if you're joining in because you're all muted, but you know, you can try. Pom, 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 went Abraham's euphony thingy, what's it? And far away out in the village of Ashcombe, people started to hear it, this pom, pom, pomming. And his wife, her name was Paul, she heard it first. She said, that's my Abraham, he must be in some kind of trouble. And she got the men in the village to help her and they made their way out it, it, over the hills in the complete darkness. And they just followed the pom, pom, pomming. And it was Paul. She got there first. And as soon as she got there, she saw Abraham up to his waist in the bog and she saw the Queen of the Pixies and she saw all the other Pixies all around. And she knew that Abraham always said he didn't believe any, any of this stuff. And she knew how frightened he'd be. And she called out to him. She said, Abraham, turn something inside out. Huh? said Abraham. He couldn't turn his jacket inside out because it was all sodden with the bog. So he, he took his hat off his head and he punched it. And as soon as he punched his hat inside out, then all the little pixie lanterns started to go out like fireflies, one after another, after another. And finally, Joan the Wad just began to fade there. And when the men arrived up behind Paul, there was nothing to be seen apart from Abraham standing, playing his euphony thingy, what's it? And they threw a rope out to him and they dragged him out of the bog and they, he was all sodden and they got him home and Paul dried him off and she gave him a hot cup of cocoa and he was all right. But, you know, it was quite a few weeks before he went back to the pub at Clay Hyden and joined all the other men there. But when he did go, he never again said that he didn't believe in the pixies or the fairies. So that's the tale of Abraham Stocker and the Pixies, um, as I said, from uh, Tales of the Blackdown Borderlands. Thank you. Um, when I first found that story, it was it was a real. Oh, sorry, did someone want to say something? No. Um, when I first found that story, it was a real labour of love because um, the story was written. It had been written down in a Somerset dialect, so um, it was. You know, it kind of took me a whole day to transcribe it. <laughs> it was great. Um, yeah, I think that's a bit of a gem, that story. So that's, so that's my next jewel found um, along the Calm Valley. And I've got one more jewel and about 10 minutes left to share it with you. Um, so one more jewel that I want to share with you of the many that I found along the valley. And... Um, and this jewel, this next jewel is the jewel of um, the name Culm. Because when I first started working on the project, of course, Culm, I'm always interested in place names and names generally. And I was immediately curious, well, what does Culm mean? So I looked it up, you know, as you do, I went on the internet and, um, According to the internet, it possibly might mean come from a Celtic word, which means knot or tie. Um, I quite like that because it's felt it linked in with the kind of the history of the textiles history on the in the Calm Valley. Then I went to Columpton and I was told, no, this wasn't the meaning of the word calm. Um, calm came from Saint Cullum. And um, so and Saint Cullum is said to preach with down by the river Calm, so that's why the river's called Calm. But then I discovered that there isn't just one St. Cullum, but there's actually two, and there may be more, but I've discovered two so far. There's one St. Cullum who comes from Scotland and I, we originally came from Ireland and then he went to Scotland and preached in the north of England. But there's another St. Cullum much, much closer. And this St. Cullum comes from Cornwall. 
And when I started to explore this St. Colum, I discovered that she is a woman and that she has a very intriguing story. So as I said, I haven't got time to tell you the whole story, but I'm gonna just try and give you a little taste of it. So, St. Colum from Cornwall. Well, the story, again, is in Cambridge. It's written down in a document, very old document, that's kept in a library in Cambridge. And in this very old document, it tells that there once, long ago, was a great queen who lived in Cornwall, whose name was Morgoise, or Morgana La Fay, half-sister of the great high king of these lands, King Arthur. And Morgana La Fay, one of the nine ladies of the lake, she had nine daughters. Now, the thing about being one of the ladies of the lake, this time, this time where there were great destructive forces rushing across the land. Morgana knew that things were changing and changing fast and that things for women were changing fast. And when she looked at her nine daughters, she was frightened for them. I must teach them some powerful magic, she thought to herself, so they can protect themselves. And she took her nine daughters out in the half light when the moon was full and they gathered all things they could find that were white and silver. And as they had gathered these things, then Morgana, she cooked up a great spell. And with this spell, she taught her nine daughters how to turn themselves into doves. Now there was a very specific reason that she chose doves Doves and pigeons, they're in the same family. And the Latin and French word for them <coughs> is calum. Calum. And the thing about doves and pigeons is they are fantastic at escaping from predators. They have very loose feathers at the back. So when a predator goes to snatch at them, the feathers simply come away in the mouth of the predator. And they also have a very particular way of rising up very, very fast. So they're absolutely brilliant at escaping from predators. And the other thing about doves is they are homing birds. Go out into the world, said Morgana to her nine daughters, and tell the world what I've told you. Tell stories, cast spells, do your magic. Let it be seen, but keep your freedom because your power is in your freedom. And any man that tries to take that from you you must never submit. So the nine daughters, they went out into the world and one of them, Kalum, the dove woman, she came up to Columpton. And there she sat by the river in Columpton, by the river Calm, not just Columpton, I suspect, but all along the river. Down there she sat by the river, by the wells, by the pools, by the lakes that were once there. And the women from the villages, they would come and they would sit with her and she would tell her stories. and She would share some of the magic that her mother had taught her. Of course, there was a king who came across the land and he didn't like the power that she had. And he decided the best way to take the power away from her was to force her into marriage. And of course, she didn't want to marry him because she knew that would mean losing her power. So he said very well, you won't choose to marry me, then I will, I will make it impossible for you to refuse me. And he went to snatch at her. But as he went to snatch at her, she turned herself into a dove and she flew. He was just left with a handful of feathers. And again and again, three times he went to snatch at her. And each time the dove's feathers came away. But each time she weakened a little. And the third time he went to snatch at her, she didn't have enough energy to turn herself into a dove. And she remained in her human form. And she was much more vulnerable like this. So he took her and he put her into a tower with a very, very tall tower with a little window right at the top. He said, you will stay there with no food and no water. You will submit to me. But that night, there was a great flight of pigeons and doves that flew around the tower. 
and that great flight of pigeons and doves, they flew in through the little window in the top of the tower and they flew down and they had medicine and food and water attached to their little legs and then they turned themselves back into women and they coo-coo-coo-cooed to Kalum, their sister. You can do a bit of cooing too if you want to. Coo-coo-coo. It's a bit difficult with my croaky voice. <coughs> But after three days and three nights, Kalum, she had regained her strength. And once again, she was able to turn herself into a dove and she flew up out of the window and was gone. Of course, this made the king very angry and he continued trying to snatch at her. And three times he caught her and three times her sisters came to her aid and they cooed and they comforted and they helped her restore her strength. But on the next time the king caught her, he said to her, you've made it clear you're not gonna to submit to me. And if you won't submit, then I will destroy you. And he brought out a great wheel and he was gonna break her in some horrible way on this wheel. But no sooner had the wheel been brought out and Kalum had been marched out by the soldiers. And the doves, they came, the doves and the pigeons and they landed there on the wheel and they coo, coo, coo. And they cooed three times and the wheel turned to dust. But the king would not be so easily defeated as that. And he pushed Kalum into a field that was full of golden corn. I will cut a pathway, he said. And he cut a pathway through the corn. And Kalum was pushed and pushed into the final corner of the, of the corn until finally her head was cut from her shoulders like the corn is cut from the stem. But where the blood fell on the ground, fresh water sprung up, a spring bubbling, clear, fresh water, and Kalum felt herself falling down, down, down into the water. And down she went to the underworld. And there in the underworld, she had a great many adventures, which I haven't got time to tell you about right now. But down there in the underworld, she met with Joan the Wad, queen of the pixies. And Kalum and Joan the Wad, they became great, great friends. They discovered that both of them had skills for guiding people home. Both of them were very good at comforting those who were frightened, bringing people what they needed when they were alone and afraid. So after a time, Kalum discovered that she could grow her feathers back and she knew that it was time for her to return to the upper world. But now she becomes such good friends with Joan the Wad. And Joan the Wad, with her pointed ears and her black skin and her eyes so bright. Kalum said, oh Joan, it feels as if you've become my sister. And she went and she flung her white arms around Joan's black arms. And Joan said, yes, Kalum, we are sisters now. We will always be friends and together we will always help people, not only in your world, but here in the underworld too. And maybe in other worlds, who knows where our adventures will take us. Then Kalum opened her wings and she flew out of the underworld and she flew up through the water. And as she came up through the water, the water washed her clean and she turned into a woman again. And as she stood there in the field where the corn had been cut, a great, a great deal of time had passed. Months had gone by while she'd been down in the underworld. And the corn had been cut and the new corn was starting to grow, little green kernels growing up out of the earth. And just in that moment, a great flight of pigeons came in and they landed there in the field and they turned themselves back into women. And Kalum, she ran to them and they flung their arms around her. Kalum, they said, we knew you'd come back. We searched everywhere in this world for you. We searched across the oceans. We searched across the deserts. And when we couldn't find you anywhere in this world, we knew you must have gone to another world. But Kalum, we always knew you'd find your way back because you're like us. You're a homing bird. We are all of us homing birds. 
and we will always find our way home. And so it is, even to this day, that Kalum, the homing bird, she flies along the river Calm and through the Calm Valley. And Joan the Wad, queen of the pixies, she makes her way through the bogs and the marshes. And both of them, they will be guiding people safely back home. So that's the end of my tale of Kalun. Um, yeah, personally, I find that story um, really comforting. And I really love the idea of Kalumpton coming from the word Kalum, because um, I've got a French friend and I asked her, what's dove in French? And she said, ah, it is Kalum. And I thought, oh, Kalum, it's so beautiful. So yeah, it's given me a whole new perspective on uh, the Kalm and Kalumpton. And yeah, hopefully it will give you a different perspective too. Thank you. Absolutely wonderful. Thank you, Claire. And um, I think a couple of people have, have unmiked. So yeah, if you could um, join me in um, giving Claire a wonderful round of applause again to, to express our thanks for her wonderful stories. <laughs> and if anybody um, would like to ask a question or um, anything at this point, you know, if the, we've got a few minutes just to explore anything, if anybody would like to, um, yeah, ask anything. I'll stop the recording at this point, um, actually. And um, I noticed Julian's written fabulous in the chat. So thank you, Julian. I'll just share that with Claire in case you can't see the, uh, the chat. So yeah, I'll just stop the recording. And then if anybody would like to unmic and ask anything or share anything with us, then that would be great. <laughs>